Okay. I'd like to welcome everyone to this high level roundtable on 21st century digital trade. Um, let's just take a very brief moment to say, thank God we all live in the digital age, because I can remember as recently as a year ago when we would have done a meeting like this in person. Um, and at least with all this fantastic new technology, we can still meet online and still have interesting discussions. And I'm very much looking forward uh, to the discussion today. Um, I think, as everyone knows, uh, we're going to talk today about the uh, this uh, fantastic new OECD project, the Digital Services Trade Restriction Restrictiveness Index. It's not even easy to say, uh, let alone to read or or uh, or produce. Um, the index is not our only point of interest. We're, of course, very interested in the reality that lives behind it, because I think, as we will learn today, and as many of us know from our daily lives, uh, digital trade, the the, the movement of data across borders has become an incredibly important uh, part of our economy. Um, I'll say a few minute, few words about it in a moment. I'm sure we'll be hearing more about it from our speakers in a second. Before I do, let me just briefly say uh, that we will hear from the OECD for the first 20 minutes. Uh, Javier and Janos, um, whom I'll introduce in a moment, have prepared a lovely presentation. Uh, we will then go to Ricardo Castanera from the Portuguese uh, permanent representation here. Of course, Perhaps not quite yet representing the European Union presidency, but we all know it's coming right around the corner and we look forward to hearing about your plans on that, Ricardo. And of course, Karina Stan has joined us as well uh, from the Developers Alliance and will talk to us a bit about what these issues mean uh, to small businesses, uh, to app developers and to people doing doing work in the digital economy uh, that maybe aren't, uh, aren't uh, large uh, players. Look, I think we said it in the invitation, and it's maybe uh, it's maybe worth repeating. Um, digital trade has quadrupled in the last five years, uh, which was, I believe, when I last wrote a paper about it, um, roughly five years ago. Fourfold growth in that time to over 20 zettabytes. Um, in case you're wondering what a zettabyte is, it's 10 to the 27th power, which is something called a sextillion. I don't even know what that is, but let's just say it's an awful lot of data. Um, it accounts for more than $3 trillion of economic value added, and that's a very low estimate um, of its role in the modern economy today. And of course, more than one of two jobs in the digital sector. Um, but we've seen an awful lot of um, movement uh, to restrict or contain uh, these, uh, these data flows. We, we all know the privacy shield was struck down at the summertime. Uh, that might or might not have been a good idea. We have that discussion on some other occasion, but the fact is it happened. Um, and what was left were these uh, standard uh, contractual clauses, um, which are extremely important. But now we hear some noise in particular from the Irish data protection supervisor that maybe these clauses are not enough. So my worry, and I'll just put the question um, right out there in front of us, is are we stumbling into a situation a little bit like we did with Brexit, where there's a very real threat out there uh, that we might not have taken into account yet. It's something that I'm sure we'll be talking about in the course of this discussion um, later today. Um, on that note, if you don't mind, let me just pass the floor uh, directly over to the colleagues uh, from the OECD, Javier Lopez Gonzalez, a senior trade policy analyst, and Janos Ferenc, also from Javier's team uh, at the Trade and Agriculture Department. Uh, uh, they've produced this lovely index, um, which, uh, first of all, takes on the very important question of how do you measure digital trade? I think given how important it is, one of the first things we need to do is have reliable, robust, and understandable metrics. And they'll be telling us a little bit about that. And then once, now that you've figured out how to measure it, we'd like to know a little bit about what your measurements are telling us. Um, and on that note, I pass uh, the floor over to you. If I can just say, we will be taking questions later on. If you can post your question in the chat room, uh, we will call on you um, when, the, uh, when the moment comes. Um, and if you're comfortable with it, we'd appreciate if as many of you as possible could keep your cameras on. We like to see you and feel like we're all coming together, even in these uh, slightly uh, Byzantine times of um, a coronavirus lockdown. Um, Javier Llanos, uh, the floor is yours, and let me thank you both for taking time to be with us today and congratulate you on this outstanding contribution to this debate and discussion. So th thank you very much, Paul, and let me thank you for your very kind invitation for giving us a place to sort of to talk about some of the ideas we've had. And I, I guess, as you mentioned, this is a very complex environment. And 
So some of the work that we've been doing is trying to put a bit of structure in this complex environment. Uh, just to sort of say something on, on your quote on terms of how much bit, how many bits and bytes there are out there. I was doing some research and there are more bits and bytes out there uh, in the world than there are stars in the expanding universe. So I, I thought that was another neat way of putting it. There's loads of other ways of putting it, but I think it's, it's, a, it's another neat way of doing it. Uh, without further ado, let me jump straight into it. And the first thing that I want to do is talk a bit more about the remit of digital trade um, and sort of highlight that, you know, there's a lot of things that are new. There's a lot of things that are not new. But what is especially important when we think about digital trade is how there's much more traditional trade. So digital digitalization has this impact on trade cost. And this means not just more ICT goods and high tech, you know, trade stuff happening, but also, you know, more carrots, more natural resources, more agri-food, more low tech products whizzing around the world because digitalization has that impact on overall trade cost. At the same time, we're also seeing a lot more digitally ordered parcels which are crossing borders. And of course, this has implications uh, for the way that we deal with uh, items crossing uh, uh, borders and customs issues. But there's also more digitally delivered trade. This includes clearly services or new services, but also applications. And I think something that's quite important is sort of the, the new smart products that are being traded, which sort of combine the characteristics of goods, services, and data, and they're constantly connected. Um, and there's also clearly with this much more cross-border data flows, which underpins all different uh, digital trade transactions that take place. And with this, with this digital trade environment, there are many more opportunities for individuals and firms uh, to benefit. But clearly, there are also new challenges that emerge. And I think it's important to first of all stress that trade rules continue to apply, whether digitally delivered or physically delivered goods or services, you know, the rules in the WTO, the GATS and the GATS still matter. But there are new discussions that are being had uh, on some of the elements that might be a bit more difficult or where the, we might need a bit more clarification. And this is taking place in the WTO and the e-commerce joint statement. But I think what's important about this evolving environment is how these rules apply has become a bit more complex. So I mentioned earlier sort of the goods and the services and the smart products. You know, we have rules that are for goods, GATS, and for services, GATS. So when you have an item that combines the characteristics of both, it complicates things a bit more. And then we add data to the mix, which, you know, even further complicates issues. But also it's important to note that there are old issues that raise new uh, questions. So, for example, in the context of trade and parcels, we have issues about de minimis or tariffs when you collect taxes on items that are below a certain threshold. And that raises new issues. Um, and then important to think about this is that, you know, simple transactions rest on a series of other enabling and supporting factors. And here's where sort of the digital STRI comes in because it provides a very nice way of trying to summarize what those things are. So I'm going to start with the data flows and then Janos will follow with uh, sort of the, the, the digital STRI. And the first thing to say here is clearly that data underpins all kind of social and economic uh, activities of the modern day. We've always spoken about global value chains and clearly data is behind much of those. It allows us to coordinate fragmented modes of production. Uh, but also it allows smaller firms to access global markets and it's fundamentally changing how goods and services are produced and also uh, how they are delivered and you know you can try and think about an uh, international trade transaction and it's difficult to find one today that is not supported by some cross-border data flow at the same time i'd argue that a lot of domestic transactions are underpinned by a cross-border data flow as well, owing to the way that firms are managing you know, their, their, their data by cloud computing or by the use of different types of mirrors. But data is different, and there are very significant and important benefits from enhancing its use and reuse. And I find this sort of triangle very useful because it sort of gives us a bit of an insight into how bits and bytes translates into dollars and cents. And we see at the bottom of the triangle here, there is data and data has no intrinsic value. It's only valuable when we sort of turn data in, into information and then information in knowledge. And when we act upon that knowledge in the wisdom area, that's when we derive value from data. And so data is not valued at volume at the bottom of the pyramid, but rather at the top of the pyramid at the wisdom element at use. Um, but what's really important about data is that um, it can be copied. It's not consumed 
when uh, when it when it is being used. So it, be, it can be copied and reused, and that means that there are considerable increasing returns to scale and scope from sharing data, including uh, across borders. But clearly, it's not all rosy. You know, there are some challenges that are emerging. So the pervasive exchange of data is fueling concerns, which might be about privacy protection about national security, about intellectual property. There's also issues about regulatory reach and uh, digital industrial policy. And this is especially the case when data crosses jurisdictions. We have this internet that is this global infrastructure, but clearly regulations uh, are, are not. And so what we've seen is a growing number of data policies that either restrict the movement of data or that mandate that data is stored in specific uh, locations. In terms of cross-border data flows, we've looked at about 160 different regulations across the globe, and we can sort of categorize these into four different, what I like to call, buckets. And these buckets are uh, sort of fungible. They're not well defined, but it's, it's important to sort of put things into sort of neat order so that we can make the problem a bit smaller. The first type of approach is where there is absolutely no regulation. And the problem with this type of approach is that you might be able to send data but some might be reluctant to send you data because you're not actually protecting. So that kind of causes a few issues. And we're seeing that there's no regulation in quite a number of LDCs. The second approach is an ex post accountability approach where you're allowed to send data to wherever you want. You just have to make sure that if it is misused, you will be liable for it. So there is some kind of, uh, of liability mechanism that is ingrained in that system. The third type of approach is a flow conditional and safeguards. This is something that we're more familiar with in the context of the EU, where you are allowed to send data to a country provided that there is an adequacy or an equivalence decision. And in the absence of one of these, you can use things such as standard contractual clauses or binding corporate rules. And sort of the fourth type of approach is one where it's a flow which is conditional on ad hoc authorization. That means that data is not allowed to flow except when you ask for some kind of authorization from a particular governing body. And this is a more kind of like ad hoc, you know, maybe sometimes the data flow is accepted, maybe sometimes it's not accepted type of approach. And so the issue here is that what we're seeing is a patchwork of regulation which creates challenges. And these are challenges for governments and individuals in terms of some uncertainties related to the applicable rules in any given situation. And importantly, these have a dual effect well, this patchwork has a dual effect on firms. First of all, it increases trade costs. Uh, so it's more difficult to operate across different markets. But I think also importantly, it's much more difficult to, for firms to know what level of data protection they need to afford to consumers in different markets. So it means that it also compromises data protection itself. So in the context of this evolving regulation, what we've also seen is that governments have turned to different instruments to enable data flows with trust. So in this sense, governments try and find sort of this trust via either plurilateral agreements, which are basically can be non-binding regulations such as the OECD privacy guidelines or Convention 108 or ABEC cross-border privacy regime. Or we're also seeing this sort of uh, data language in the context of trade agreements and partnerships, notably the CPTPP or the USMCA, but also new types of partnerships that are emerging, such as the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement between New Zealand, Chile and, um, and Singapore. But also we're seeing further use of unilateral instruments. I spoke about these earlier, binding corporate rules and standard contractual clauses. And I think a solution to these issues, which is important to continue looking at, is sort of the, 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 the digital solution to the digital problem, which is kind of like private sector and other initiatives. This is about using, you know, agreeing on the use of sandboxes, using encryption and things like that, that enable, uh, you know, to, to, to have permission to access to certain types. Now, making progress on this issue is very difficult, and this is a, not only a very sensitive topic, but is also a topic that's evolving in a rapidly changing landscape. In July, we had the Schrems II decision, which completely sort of turned things upside down the way we thought about standard contractual clauses and about adequacy. Uh, but also things are likely to evolve quite a lot with new discussions at the WTO Joint Statement Initiative. We very recently had RCEP that had language and data flows, also changing how we think about cross-border data transfers. And there's a lot of things happening at the OECD, including 
around Brexit or around the possibility of a US federal regulation on privacy and a lot of movement in non-OECD countries such as Brazil, China or India. And I think what's important here is that we need to continue the discussions on ways of trying to make this sort of patchwork, these four different types of approaches, much more interoperable. And we also need to break some policy silos and start working across the sort of the privacy area, the, the science area, and also the trade area to ensure that we have this sort of environment for data flows with trust. And in that sense, with some of the colleagues that are working on science, technology, and innovation at the OECD, we're trying to put all this knowledge together into a sort of an OECD-wide horizontal initiative uh, on, on data governance. And uh, let me leave it at that and pass it on to uh, Janos to say a few words about uh, digital STI which, uh, you know, tries to encapsulate some of the elements that I've spoken of in a sort of a more inclusive way. Thank you, Javier. Let me very briefly share my screen as well. Uh, good afternoon to all participants. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. Um, and let me also take a moment to thank the Lisbon Council for organizing this important roundtable today. Um, as uh, Javier outlined in his presentation, the OECD's work uh, has been quite comprehensive and has been looking a lot at the analytical thinking behind some of the key issues related to uh, changing business models, market openness, and of course, cross-border data flows. Uh, but our work covers also building the evidence base for, um, for regulatory transparency and to, and, and, to, and to get a better idea, a better sense of what uh, governments are doing with respect to regulations affecting digital trade. So to that end, we embarked to, on developing a new instrument uh, that helps us to identify, catalog and quantify uh, regulatory barriers uh, that affect digital enabled services. Uh, so this is the OECD Digital Services Trade Restrictiveness Index or the Digital SDRI. Um, just a few words uh, as background about this tool. Um, services are a very important component of all countries' economies, and particularly among OECD and EU countries, services account for over 80% of economic output, and also uh, most of employment and most new jobs are related to services. So with the, with the increased digitalization, services can also more easily be traded online. Uh, but as services uh, grow, as, uh, as the tradability of, of different digital enabled services grow, uh, so does the risk that uh, regulatory barriers might derail some of the benefits of digitalization. So this pointed us uh, in the direction of the need for a new instrument that, uh, that provides with transparency and is comprehensive with respect to understanding what is actually happening ac across countries? What, what is the regulatory environment uh, that affects digital trade? So this instrument builds on a broader project uh, done at the OECD, uh, where we look at different uh, services sectors and the regulatory barriers behind it, but we didn't have something specifically looking at digital trade barriers. Um, so the digital STRI has two key components. Uh, the first one is a regulatory database that collects information from laws and regulations um, about the existence of trade barriers. And the second component is, uh, is an index that translates this regulatory information uh, into a quantifiable uh, outcome. And the indices vary from uh, zero to one. We use a binary system and an algorithm to quantify and weigh the different uh, barriers that we identify. And we use a standard framework across all countries, uh, which allows us to be comparable uh, and, and to identify uh, issues, identify the same issues across countries. In terms of coverage, we currently have 46 countries. This includes all OECD members, of course, uh, but also all G20 countries and most of the EU members. Um, in terms of the coverage, um, we, we have information for 2014 all the way to 2019. Uh, we, when we developed this tool, we decided to look back in time to have a longer time series that allows us to better, uh, better understand what has been happening 
uh, in this uh, in this area over time. So now we have uh, annual information for all these years. And even better, we try to update this uh, tool every year, which means that we are just about to finalize the 2020 edition of the digital STRI. And I will tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, let me tell you how, how does this uh, new tool look like and what are the key components. Uh, we have five uh, key policy areas along which we structure the framework of measures um, that, that we collect uh, for all countries. The first one relates to infrastructure and connectivity. And here we look at measures uh, that relate particularly to telecommunications and uh, communication services as being the foundation of uh, all digital activities. Uh, for instance, we look at measures related to interconnection between communication systems. We also look at restrictions on the use of communication services, for instance, on VPN related restrictions. And we have a series of measures looking at different regulatory approaches uh, on cross-border data flows. The second policy area is on electronic transactions. Here we look at all types of measures uh, that relate to, for instance, what you might need when you are ordering something online. For instance, um, electronic commerce related licensing requirements, um, potential national regulations that might deviate from international uh, best practices, uh, the validity of electronic signatures, the existence of dispute settlement, and so on. The third policy area is on payments, which is, again, a very important cross-cutting area for all type of digital transactions. Here we look at measures related to access to payment systems, for instance, electronic wallets, um, contactless payment, etc. We also look at um, uh, whether there is alignment of uh, domestic standards with international standards when it comes to payment security measures. Uh, and restrictions on internet banking. The fourth area is on intellectual property rights. Uh, particularly here, we look at two types of IPRs, uh, namely trademarks and copyrights. And we also look at two dimensions of IPRs, the one being the scope of protection, which, uh, which we look at whether it's in line with international conventions. And the second um, dimension is the enforcement of IPRs, and particularly whether um, and there is an efficient system in place to enforce IPRs. Uh, the last and uh, the, the last category is a bit more of a, uh, an other category, a catch-all category, where we include barriers uh, related to limitations on uh, downloading or streaming, for instance, um, or restrictions on online advertising, uh, commercial or local presence requirements, and so on. So. There are essentially three key takeaways that I would like you to uh, you to take away from this presentation today. The first one is where do we stand today? What is the regulatory environment on a global scale for digital trade? And for that, um, here are the digital STRIs for 2019. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the scores uh, the, the the scores for countries range between zero and one, where one uh, marks the highest level of restriction. So the lower the score on the digital STRI, the more open the regulatory environment is for digital trade. And here you see that um, in, in some countries, the level of barriers remain relatively high. Um, also, if you look at the components or the key causes behind this, uh, this outcome, in many countries, if not all, there is a strong influence by the measures related to infrastructure and connectivity. And, and this is particularly worrisome because uh, this, is, this is the key component that underpins any type of transaction. So think about telecommunication services, uh, data flows. So these measures remain the key contributors across most countries. The second key message that I would like you to take away relates to the evolution of these regulations over time. And what we notice is that regulations are becoming increasingly more burdensome. And this is, uh, this is again, worrisome because um, we see a much faster, uh, faster pace of measures that tighten digital trade than measures that liberalize it. Um, and recently, we, we, have saw, we have seen measures that um, 
that affect particularly online payment systems or localization requirements that are particularly uh, costly for firms to, um, to, to, to handle in the context of digital trade. Some emerging measures uh, also come across from this exercise, um, particularly tightening requirements on cloud computing services. And this is a very important topic, particularly this year, given that we're all working from home, all working from, uh, from different places. So cloud computing becomes more important. Yet we see that uh, particularly up until 2019, there has been a particularly uh, difficult environment for cloud computing in some countries due to um, uh, cumbersome uh, approval requirements and, uh, and also measures related to data flows. Uh, the other emerging measure is on mandatory routing of internet traffic. And this is particularly uh, cumbersome because, com because companies would, would need to hire um, local servers to make sure that they route their data to specific countries. Um, then the question is, uh, is this picture going to change this year, given the, the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, some of the preliminary insights that we have from this year's update suggest that there might be a slowdown in the increase of restrictions for digital trade. Um, and this is, this is what the news, uh, potential implications or potential costs, of course, could be related to the, to the pandemic. Um, governments realize that it is very important to, uh, to, to enable digital trade, not to impose unnecessary barriers, um, and, and to also facilitate some of the key measures uh, that underpin trades, for instance, electronic signatures, um, trade, uh, promoting contactless payment, and so on. Um, it could also be influenced by the ongoing discussions at the WTO, as Javier mentioned, that since progress is being made there, that there could be uh, less need for governments to act unilaterally. But lastly, I think it's also important to note that uh, this, this trend might be temporary because uh, we are aware of different regulatory initiatives across many countries um, that are in the pipeline at the moment and, and that might um, that that might make it uh, that might change this picture going forward in the next few years um, but just wanted to give you this preliminary insights um, we are going to give a bit more detailed report on this in January uh, next week Wow. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. you. You surprised me. I didn't realize you were building to the conclusion there. Um, I, I just have uh, two more slides, if I if okay, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so just the third point that that I wanted to kind of uh, as, as the main takeaway was also <clears throat> on, uh, on 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 the fact that digital trade is global, but regulations are not. Um, so we have also developed a second set of indices that look at uh, regulatory similarity among countries. And I think this is particularly interesting because it shows uh, the value of some of the regional efforts to, um, to integrate regulations, particularly among the EU countries, for instance, that have a very similar regulatory environment. Um, I also very briefly wanted to show you uh, some of the tools that we have online. And uh, if, if you look at this, uh, it has all the information for all the countries that we have. And it also has a cool feature that allows uh, the users to simulate what policy uh, changes good countries implement and how would that affect the, the index. Um, and really the last slide. Uh, so before just uh, finalizing, I think it's important to highlight um, some of the implications of the pandemic this year, because um, with respect to trade, trade also plays a very important role to enabling digitalization. And this was very clear this year when we saw that um, Trade plays a very important role to making uh, access to internet, uh, um, uh, the, to, to keep the cost of accessing the internet low. Um, but it's also very important to make sure that the devices that we use, uh, such as the laptops or, or uh, smartphones, they, that, that we have access to these. Um, and we know that, for instance, tariffs on ITA goods, they remain high. So trade plays a very important role in that aspect as well. Um, and last but not least, um, digitalization will also be important for trade. So we spoke a little bit about um, uh, the role of uh, facilitating uh, processes at borders and making electronic signatures uh, more widely recognized. 
So there's a two way street. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. There's a two way street between uh, digitalization and trade uh, that help to enable each other. So I will leave it at that. And apologies, my my voice is going away slowly. It's been a long time. Okay. Thank okay. You. Thank you. If you if you don't mind, I will thank you for that, Janos. I'm going to abuse my position as the host here and ask the first question. We we'll come to you in a moment, Ricardo. Um, uh, you said it quite well. Digital trade is global, but regulation is not. <clears throat> and I believe you're tracking 46 countries. Of those 46 countries, how many is the situation getting worse? And and what are the key problems we see? You touched on a couple of them. You mentioned cloud regulation. What are the key issues here that are potentially contentious and maybe I can ask a question in that area too which is how do we what's the difference between a legitimate trade restriction and there are some some reasons why we might want to restrict some of this trade data privacy being one of them how do we draw the line between those kinds of distinctions we ought to be making and and what is in fact actually a phony argument that's just to protect the local market Thank you, Paul. Uh, very good questions. Uh, going <laughs> right into the deep water. Um, so, with respect to your first question, so actually, um, what we see is that it's usually a couple of countries that tend to have a larger number of uh, trade tightening measures. So it's not it's it's not the majority of countries that they all have restrictive measures. <clears throat> Rather, it's it's usually a couple of countries that. Um, that introduce a series of measures that ultimately create a much more tightening environment within that country. Um, in terms of the key issues, there are um, there are a couple of issues. Um, one that I highlighted also is uh, with respect to measures that affect the infrastructure uh, and particularly the communication services. Um, we have seen that uh, particularly the telecommunications environment, the telecommunication services, is very difficult to regulate. It's a very complex environment. It's uh, it, it has a lot of regulations in terms of competition, in terms of uh, market access for new entrants. So getting the regulatory environment right is not an easy task. And, and what we see there is that uh, increasingly it's becoming more and more complex for firms to try and access uh, foreign telecommunications markets. The, the other area is also what Javier highlighted in terms of the regulations on data. So we see an increase for data regulations. And in some countries, we also see a tightening approach towards uh, data measures. Uh, then other areas where we where, where I think is particularly important to pay attention to is on payments. Um, and this is this is an enabling uh, series of measures where uh, where you need payments for all those or any digital transaction. Uh, but increasingly, if you impose requirements related to having a local bank account for, for accessing digital payments, or if you need specific domestic standards that may vary from one country to the next, those are potential barriers that make it more difficult to access um, new types of payment uh, solutions. So I think these are maybe the, the key issues that I would like to highlight. Um, and and on your question on where to draw the line between um, trade enabling uh, measures and measures that are adopted on on different policy grounds, I think this is a um, this is a very complex matter and probably requires maybe a separate uh, webinar on its own. But our approach has been that uh, in the international trading environment. There are recognized exceptions where governments might need to take action based on legitimate public policy grounds or in the interest of their own security. Um, so there are instances where trade regulations allow for this, and there are also principles that governments ought to follow. Uh, good regulatory principles in this domain are transparency, non-discrimination, um, and not imposing measures that are more trade restrictive than necessary, so having a proportionality test. Uh, but that said, the challenge here is particularly on on, uh, on identifying or defining those legitimate uh, exceptions and, and, and to what extent governments have a discretion in determining what those are. So if, so if you have a very broad discretion on those measures, then it will be uh, much easier to, uh, to implement more 
uh, trade restrictive measures, uh, and and that could be could could tilt the balance towards uh, towards more more of a trade tightening environment. Great, uh, we have had a, a small uh, computer issue, so Paul has been. Uh kicked out of the meeting temporarily. So I will take over. My name is David Ozzel, Director of Research at the Lisbon Council. Uh, so I'm just, thanks a lot, Janos. I'm just here to ask Ricardo to jump in with uh, with his comments. Hopefully, Paul will reconnect in a matter of minutes. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, good afternoon to, to everyone. Many thanks for the invitation. Um, there is always a double pleasure on your events. First of all, because of the high quality of the panelists, and second, because of the name of your think tank. It's really close to, to our hearts. Um, we really welcome uh, Janos and uh, Javier contributions for uh, or to build this uh, OECD index. We believe that it's a very good tool to guide us through the main bottlenecks that must be addressed at the policy level. We, and according to the slides, Portugal is placed in mid positions. It means that we can uh, still improve. Um, unfortunately, digital trade, digital trade is suffering a tightening of the regulatory environment that the index um, just uh, shows. Um, but this is not a surprise if we look to the overall services trade performance in the past years. But this should be really a concern and a call to action for um, the European Union. We are the largest trading bloc globally, and we believe um, in a rules-based globalization. And as incoming presidency, we will have, I think, some initiatives related um, to international connectivity and its importance to Europe's digital economy, precisely because Portugal wants to promote links with other regions. And we don't want the European Union to become like an island in the digital ocean. Um, we believe that to enhance data flows, we must expand direct connectivity links with other continents and markets, which uh, is paramount to ensure the competitiveness and the resilience of the European digital economy. Um, let me just remind David and Paul that uh, three years ago, we started this kind of discussion um, with the regulation of the free flow of non-personal data. And at that time, we have advocated that unjustified national localization measures should no longer restrict the free movement of data and also that existing national measures that are unjustified and run counter to this principle should be also removed. Um, we've supported uh, that discussion at that time. We support the regulation. And now uh, probably it's time to start to see the, the results um, of uh, some of the steps that we, that we took um, in, the, in the past. And Portugal, as incoming presidency, we support the European drive towards becoming a global leader in the digital and data domain. I think that we are building a solid regulatory infrastructure and a very high uh, degree of trust among key stakeholders when we talk about data sharing economy. For example, the Data Governance Act that has just been presented, I think that it's another important step for the European data um, economy. And to take full advantage of our strengthened as um, an European single data market, we must create standards that ensure interoperability and easy the movement of data. It's our in common interest to reduce legislative and non-legislative barriers to the free flow of data, such as through the reduction of transaction costs of data sharing. And last but not the least, data as a fundamental component of the growth potential of the European digital economy economy. So there must be assurance that the, the small companies, the startups, and Karina, she will speak about that for sure, are able to enjoy the benefits of particip participating in this European uh, data market. Those are the, my first remarks, David. Can you hear me now? I have to apologize to everyone. Something that hasn't happened to me in years just happened, which is my computer crashed entirely. As you can see, I'm back on with a different, um, a different uh, background. But uh, Ricardo, I, I heard everything you had to say. That was fascinating. Um, we will come back to you in a moment with questions. But if you don't mind, uh, let's turn uh, to Karina now, um, who's going to uh, uh, tell us a little bit about how she sees digital trade and in particular 
the 70,000 uh, developers that I'm sure she receives an email from every day, um, <laughs> how they um, how they see this matter. And by the way, thanks to all for your patience. I hope I didn't miss uh, too terribly much. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, Lisbon Council for the invitation. Um, Yes, indeed, my mission is to advocate on behalf of uh, software developers. And uh, I'm quite proud of it because they're the architects of the digital world that we're increasingly relying on. And uh, software development is based on a collaborative environment where innovation and entrepreneurship are the key drivers of growth. And this is intrinsically based on global internet. And it doesn't stop at geographical and political borders. So as previously was stated, digital trade is global. Um, and the regulations are not, well, some regulations are extraterritorial. So obviously for, for developer communities, um, cross-border data flows are essential, needless to insist on. But here, um, not Houston, but Brussels, we have a problem, an acute one. The transatlantic data flows, and not only, also exchanges with, with other regions, uh, are under legal uncertainty. And, and businesses, both large and big, need a, a stable framework. Uh, the fragmentation that we encounter in the single market and, and all the inconsistencies in the interpretation of GDPR are contributing to the, the general landscape of, of legal uncertainty. And for the small businesses that provide cross-border digital services, like those of software developers, they are the most affected. And um, we, we, we don't consider GDPR uh, as a success, as many voices, we hear many voices saying, because while it, it it set a high standard of data protection, raised awareness on the need to increase, um, you know, the need to protect privacy. Um, but we have this, again, legal uncertainty. And, and the recent Schrems 2 decision is showing us that the root of, of many issues is, is stemming from the, the text of the regulation. So extraterritoriality represents a critical issue in, in our opinion, due to the conflict of laws across jurisdictions. And, and it has a significant impact on the ability of European small businesses to expand their operations outside the EU. So, uh, and this is not only a legal problem that should be fixed by a future revision of the regulation, but we think that it's a lesson that should be learned by the EU regulators. Um, and to avoid the same flowed approach, for example, for you know the, the upcoming uh, Digital Services Act or when we regulate AI, um, for us the the, the latest uh, protectionist tendencies that we see in policy and regulations in different uh, jurisdictions are, are quite worrisome, and um, the EU is lately the spotlight, unfortunately, um, and and I I have to say that. We are quite puzzled by the current Commission um, digital strategy. Developer needs and expectations are very clear. They need a single market as a business environment that supports innovation and entrepreneurship and open to trade. This is what they need. But the signals that we're receiving from Brussels are confusing in, in the sense that, um, you know, the, the, the the, the current approach is not going in this direction. Some of the objectives that are driving, you know, the latest EU legis legislative agenda seems not to really serve startups and SMEs. We, we hear and we see ambiguous language like the notion of digital sovereignty and strategic autonomy. Um, just to give concrete example, because also... Um, Ricardo mentioned the, the recently adopted Data Governance Act. Well, um, we understand that it's a, an attempt to, to give a boost to the EU data economy, but some provisions are questionable. And, and because we, we could see some digital borders raised. And 
Another example is why we are so puzzled about the Commission approach. Uh, only yesterday, the Commission issued uh, its assessment on the implementation of the geo blocking regulation. And again, we are quite contented in this case because where we need further integration of the single market of digital services, the Commission is delaying critical actions. So, and this is serving uh, some brand thinking approach from, from big media and, and there is a story behind. And, and speaking of, of brand thinking regulations, we are also worried about this tendency when it comes to the upcoming regulations on digital services and digital markets and the, the extante rules in, in, in the Digital Market Act. Um, what, by the way, the, the, the EU Commission sees as a matter of urgency in, in this case, they are basically redesigning the European digital market and, and the, the impact is significant for everybody in, 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 in those markets, not only about the big tech companies that are the main target of, of this regulation, but the entire digital ecosystems. And such regulations are highly relevant, not only when it comes to the single market competitiveness, but also in the you know, broader trade policy context. And what I would like to, to say, uh, and I will conclude, is that um, companies adapt to the business environment. Technology companies and, and you know, the software developers are pragmatic and, and will adapt to all the changes in different jurisdictions. Some of them are becoming more difficult, like the EU, unfortunately. Um, so, and they are pragmatically considering the cost of twin business. So what we propose and what we, we see is that we need a sound economic assessment of the cumulative effect of the current barriers within the single market, but also what is coming on top, these upcoming regulations that I mentioned. So we need to clearly see the, the cost of all of this, and, and which is basically reflects the cost of doing business within and, and, and in the EU. And the, the OECD Trade uh, Restrictiveness Index, is, it's, it's a great tool for, for this much needed economic assessment. Okay, thank you for that, uh, uh, Karina. Uh, if you don't, I'm sorry, when I had to reset my computer, the check got a bit scrambled. So I'm going to come to the questions backwards if I can. Uh, Ken Prop, thank you for being with us. Would you like to, uh, to, uh, to, to join the meeting and ask a question? And Chris, if you could unmute Ken, uh, we'll let him ask his question directly. Sure, um, and good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, it's nice to, to join this meeting from the other side of the ocean. Um, I, I was um, reminded by Karina's comments um, of the fact that it that it seems that a good deal of the restrictiveness um, that appears uh, in the chart with respect to EU member states may in fact relate to uh, EU legislative measures and also to the jurisprudence of the Court of Justice. Uh, that's been emerging um, on data flows uh, in, in recent years. And I just was wondering if the OECD colleagues could comment on that and uh, to what extent um, that is reflected in their, uh, in their work. Okay, and if you don't mind, rather than going back to you guys to answer that, we'll take a couple more questions um, and then we'll come back uh, to our panelists. Uh, Bas van Gies, are you uh, still on this call here somewhere? I don't see you there but I saw your hand go up. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me well? I can, and there I see you now too. Okay, excellent. Um, well, part of my question has already been answered, but I'll ask it, I'll, I'll rephrase it anyway. Um, um, we have to keep it, the end goal in mind here, right? We want to enable digital trade, and at the same time, we want to make sure that we get an understanding of how well that, that we're doing, which is why an index is so really important. Now, if we start at the micro level within a company and then zoom out a little bit, um, at the micro level within a company, if two parties are trying to exchange data, that's already pretty complex because they have to find agreement on what data will be exchanged, what it means, with what quality, all that kind of stuff. So what do they do? They try to make an agreement, and if they can't figure it out, they move one level up to the business unit uh, level and someone has to make a decision. 
there you play the same game. If two business units wants to exchange data, they have to make an agreement again. And this is already more complex than just between two people within a BU. Um, and then, uh, you know, of course, across uh, BUs within a company, across companies in the value chain, this is becoming increasingly uh, complex. And at some point you'll reach the stage where there's no dominant player who can really enforce the rules. Now, if I look at the discussion, and I say this a little bit teasingly, it looks like that we're trying to cure the situation where the regulations uh, that are not working or uh, uh, being too restrictive, and we, we try to cure the situation with more regulations, and I'm not sure if that's the right approach. So I was wondering if we could flip the situation around and look at the common ground instead. So, for example, when we want to exchange passport information, we can do this because there's a common ground. If you want to sail into the port of Rotterdam, everyone will be on the same data standards. And why can we do that? Because there is a common ground. Um, and I feel that in the discussion, we sort of lost the common ground uh, approach. So I was wondering if we could flip that around again and talk about these things as well. Yeah, thank you, Bas. And I, I ought to have asked you to introduce yourself briefly, if I if I could. Um, yeah, my name is Bas van Gils. I'm a researcher and professional uh, data management professional in the Netherlands. Yeah. I'm associated with Antwerp University, Tilburg University. And I'm uh, also associated with the Data Management Association here in the Netherlands. Okay, thank you. And you as well, uh, Ken, if you don't mind, I let you in. Um, uh, as if you needed an introduction, if you could just tell us what you're up to these days. Oops, you still seem to be muted. Ken, okay, well, um, while, while Ken is, your microphone's off, Ken. I think while Ken's working on his mic there, um, we had another question from Patrick. And if you could introduce yourself, please. Pat Patrick, are you still there? Patrick? I don't think Patrick is with us anymore. Yeah, okay. He must have had, a, had a, another meeting to go to. So I'll go to Jaime Casado, please. Okay. Yes, hello. I'd like to make a question to Ricardo. Ricardo, how are you? It's a pleasure to listen to you. Um, he's also from Portugal, as I mean. Well, the question is the following. We are going to have a new president from um, US in January with Joe Biden. We are having lots of uh, changes in other areas like South America and like Africa. How do you see uh, for the Portuguese presence that is going to start in January? The challenge of trying to rethink, restart, and reinvent the global trade, especially with the help of the digital area. Okay, thanks. Maybe we come back to a couple of our uh, speakers there first. And I think the last question um, was to you, Ricardo. Do you want to do you want to take that? Yes, Paul. Indeed, I would. Um, to hear from you too. Um, well, as I've mentioned, uh, Portugal and during the incoming presidency, we will um, give a lot of relevance to um, international connectivity, which is strongly linked to, to the data uh, flows, but not just between member states, but also to other continents and markets, as uh, Jaime just, uh, just asked. Uh, because Europe has to rise up its potential so it can match the exponential amount of data that will be generated in the country. And what we're going to do is to contribute to the EU Atlantic Data Gateway Platform. For example, with the, the inauguration of a new submarine cable, which will connect Europe uh, through south of, uh, south of Lisbon to Latin America, northeast of Brazil, the first submarine cable that will tie South America and Europe. And more initiatives of this kind would, uh, would be uh, most welcome to ensure that international cables linking to the EU and other parts of the world have uh, the speed, the capacity to keep up increasing requirements in terms of flows. And of course, the expectations in terms of international trade volumes in digital services. This is one of the aspects that we will, um, uh, of course, um, uh, develop during, during our presidency. And also, we are preparing a declaration 
also on the subject of international connectivity to, uh, uh, in order to, 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 uh, to, to achieve um, the digital software. Uh, doesn't like the, 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 the name, but that's what we still do have by now. But that is something that it's in essential to increase, um, once again, European international connectivity um, uh, and, and, and to reinforce uh, the networks with uh, different uh, blocks of, 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 uh, and regions of the world. This is something that will be uh, on our uh, plate. We will develop declarations and inaugurations. And regarding the question with the, with the, the transatlantic collaboration, well, I think that we must be uh, prudent. We will have to wait to see uh, what will be Biden's digital and trade policies. Uh, and, and, and afterwards, uh, well, try to, 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 uh, to recover the, 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 the collaboration, the cooperation between you and, and the states um, also on data, but not just on data, but also on, on data. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and listen, we, uh, we're running out of time here, so we're gonna go back to our other speakers in a moment. And if you don't mind, I'd like to once again, abuse the microphone and ask my own question here. Um, it's partly from Ricardo. Um, Ricardo, what, what is the Portuguese presidency going to do um, on growth and in particular on scaling up enterprises? I, I ask because your country has such a proud uh, tradition, much of it accomplished recently. I don't even know if people know that, but Portugal has become a real hub uh, for startups. And of course, startups are great. We love startups, but what we really want are scale ups. We want to see our successful smart companies uh, turn into global uh, titans tomorrow. I'm curious what the strategy is during your presidency, how that might relate to the topic we're discussing today on uh, trade and data localization. Um, and if any of the other speakers had some thoughts uh, to make on that too, essentially the relationship between uh, uh, data restrictiveness uh, and growth of, of small companies into medium, large, and ultimately Global Titans so big that we have to have entirely separate policies to deal with them. Um, wouldn't it be nice if we got there? Um, who'd like to go first? Can I? Ricardo. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, as you know, uh, the Portuguese economy, Paul, is, uh, is to a large extent an export based one. Our companies are used to export and benefit from the single market, but also from other non EU trading partners. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we must ensure, really ensure, that the rules based trade environment is set up for them. Uh, there is a very important, uh, uh, we are working uh, with the Commission on a, a, a very important declaration um, around new, an European startup standard, European startup standard. Uh, uh, for sure, um, a very important step in order to harmonize some of the rules that we need to have in Europe for our uh, young entrepreneurs and for the startups to flourish and also to break the kind of uh, uh, rain drain that we are um, assisting uh, all the time. Um, we think that uh, uh, there is, in Portugal, we like to, to call ourselves as a startup nation and we, there are conditions right now to, um, I would say, to foster uh, this kind of concept to an European level and to set that common ground that someone just already mentioned um, uh, a common ground that is not just based on regulation. We are talking of funding and other kinds of conditions Absolutely. Uh, that must be achieved uh, for the young entrepreneurs and the startups to flourish and also some of them to scale up, as you mentioned. But it will be on the table and on the Portuguese agenda too during the upcoming office. Okay, thank you. Karina, would you like to come in on this question in particular yeah. its relationship to uh, data localization. And and by the way, this is the last time we'll come to you. So if you have any other comments or thoughts to share before we close the meeting, please do now. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's very encouraging what we are hearing from the incoming uh, re uh, Portuguese presidency. Uh, and we are looking forward to, 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 to these uh, measures. Uh, I would like to well, data localization means for us it equals digital barriers. So Absolutely uh, not. Uh, what I would like to quickly uh, add to, to, to the debate is that 
in, in ensuring data flows, we, we, we not only need to work on regulations and, and, and uh, some, uh, Mr. Van Giels uh, mentioned, uh, you know, the need for a common ground. And I think in the Western world, we can have a common ground in, on many issues uh, that will faci- facilitate digital trade. And besides regulations, uh, I think standards are, are also an important dimension you know, to, ins- to ensure interoperable data uh, exchanges and, and uh, uh, standards on, on privacy and on security. Um, and with that, I will leave the floor for the others. Okay, thank you. And we come back to Javier at the end here. Javier, um, as I'm, you've been part of this conversation too, um, and I think the work uh, that you and Janos do uh, is terrific and is very important. Um, and there's a very clear link between these statistics and the very real world uh, that we live in, which is what we're talking about here. Um, I guess that's maybe my last question to you. What will you make of this discussion? Um, How can we ensure that we get this policy mix right going forward? And in particular, how can we help you at the OECD uh, to further this project, uh, which I think is going to be so important for policymaking going forward? Okay, so so thank you very much. I guess what I'm learning from this is that there's just no single solution. Like at the one side, it's important for policy goals to be met. On the other side, it's important for this to be done in a way that is least trade disruptive. And, you know, we can talk about standards should be and and, and things like that. But I think what the trade system does really well is something that Janos mentioned earlier. It sort of provides certain guidelines on what the regulation should look like, that it is transparent, non-discriminatory, interoperable, and that it avoids unnecessary trade restrictiveness. And I think that if we apply those standards and to find sort of like uh, a a way of acknowledging that, you know, everyone thinks that their own standard is the best standard, otherwise why would they have it in the first place? But acknowledging that as long as it's transparent, that would mean for firms that maybe it's easier to predict, therefore the cost to reduce. If it's least trade restrictive in that sense as well, that's taking into account some of the aspects. So I'm hoping that what we can find is sort of a solution that inbuilds these sort of uh, market openness principles into it. And then I just wanted to draw lastly on sort of the two elements. First of all, the common ground that was mentioned. I think a lot of progress can be made and there is a lot of common ground uh, within the EU, but also with respect to other uh, OECD countries. So there, I think it's very important. And with respect to what can people do to help us do this work? Well, we're in sort of the business of looking at the evolving environment and mapping it and feeding input so that these discussions can take place. So if you can help us increase the evidence base, that's really great. And in that sense, we're going to be doing horizontal project that I hear about data governance. So, you know, if people want to reach out with information on how best we can measure the value of cross-border data flows, that's something that could be very useful, but also on ideas on, you know, some of, some of the empirical analysis that can be done in this area so that it can feed an evidence-based policy solution to, to these uh, problems. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And on that note, I want to end with two very quick apologies. First of all, Uh, for my computer crashing. And I have to tell you, it's very difficult to chair a meeting uh, with something like that happens in the middle. And I thank you all for my patience and David for filling in. I understand nothing bad happened in that time. So so I do apologize for that. Secondly, this is an enormous topic and it's not only big and hard to wrap your mind around, um, it's also incredibly important. And I apologize that we've only scratched the surface here. I hope that this will be not the end of a conversation, but the beginning of one. And that everyone on this call will very much stay involved because a lot of what I've heard on the phone today, uh, on on the call today here is very encouraging. A lot of the right ideas are being bounced around out there, even if sometimes the wrong things happen in the real world. So let's keep talking together about this. Um, I love some of these ideas. Standards, uh, what you said, Javier, as long as there are no um, unnecessary uh, trade restrictions, well, the devil is in how we define that, of course, what what restrictions are necessary and what are not. And we will need to work on that. that issue going forward. Uh, Ricardo, for the record, I like the European data governance package too. And among the uh, the many positive elements uh, that I thought it had was an idea through and through it uh, that we need to create this uh, common uh, digital market. We need standards to open a European market for data, not one that will close it within national borders. Um, and I think that's a very powerful idea. And I was delighted to see the commission putting its full weight behind that. 
Uh, someone mentioned uh, that the proposal had been adopted. It most certainly hasn't. It will, of course, be negotiated during your presidency, and we're looking forward uh, to your leadership on that. If we can contribute in any way, uh, we would be delighted to, because I think the objective is a very noble one, and let's uh, let's make sure it happens and happens the right way for the right reasons. Let me also apologize for running late with this meeting. Uh, next week, uh, December 9th at 3 o'clock, uh, we'll be hosting Nicholas Christakis and Stella Kiriakides, the Commissioner for Health, uh, for a fascinating roundtable on coronavirus, uh, which if any of you have time, I would encourage you to join, even though I think you probably know you've heard everything there is to say about coronavirus by now. Uh, there's actually a lot more. Nicholas has just published a lovely book called Apollo's Arrow. He's one of the leading epidemiologists uh, in the United States, and he will uh, present the book uh, and have a discussion with the commissioner on what all of this means. And on that note, uh, let me again apologize for checking out on you for a few minutes. I can assure you I didn't pop out to the pharmacy or anything. Um, thank you for your patience. I hope to see you all soon. And thanks to my team for uh, for holding the fort down and for organizing this uh, this lovely event. Thanks to all of you for coming too.